y'all, and welcome to the channel. I'm the Weld Noki, and I'm excited to introduce to you guys a new four-part series that's going to be covering everything you need to know to get started doing TIG art. Um, I want to just take this time to let everybody know what you're going to get with me is real, raw, and unedited. Um, jean shorts and all. So I'd like to welcome you all to my lab that I do everything it is that I like to do. I, uh, I'm excited to go in depth and cover everything from A to Z that y'all need to put the right foot forward to be able to start your journey doing TIG art. I know it's something that hasn't been covered very much. You get to see the results, but you don't get to see the process. And I've had question after question on Instagram, insert hashtag the well Noki. <laughs> shameless plug, but uh, I've had question after question on Instagram asking me how it is I do what I do, and that's led me to finally build up the courage to start this channel, and um, I hope y'all choose to go along with me on this journey, and I promise every video will get better as I get better. So without further ado, I'm going to bring you part one of a four-part series, which part one is going to cover everything that you need from supplies, material, and equipment to be able to do TIG art. Um, it may be a little boring, but I, I really want to cover it in depth. That way you're starting off on the right foot. So with that being said, let's get it. All right, y'all. So first thing and most important that you're gonna need is a TIG welder. So um, I'll show you what I've got. It is a Forney 220 ACDC Strictly TIG. The good thing is with doing TIG art, you don't need a fancy TIG machine. Um, I started off with the, the Vulcan, uh, their specialized TIG machine that you know, I think it could be had for, I think it's 12 or 1300 bucks. And, you know, with doing TIG art, you're running at low amperage. Uh, the highest you'll ever need to be will be 100 to 115 amps, and that's to weld your piece to the chill block, which we're gonna cover at a later video. But most of the time, you're running between 35 and I wanna say 80 amps max. So, you don't really even need a 220 hookup. You can run st off a standard 110, which makes it very easy to get into because you don't have to buy the higher end machines, right? So what I will say is you wanna make sure you get a machine that has a foot pedal because that's very important, you know, when it comes to being, being able to do TIG art. And yeah. This may rub a lot of people the wrong way, but I don't run high freak. Um, I run what they call scratch start, lift arc, um, because when you're running high frequency, a lot of times some of the machines will, that initial burst that it's programmed for the gas to come in onto your material, it's gonna put a haze and you're gonna notice that. So the way that I've been able to kind of negate that is to run lift arc. And um, that allows me to not have that happen at all. Uh, the other reason I run lift arc is like my Forney machine, for example, and a lot of the lower end, and I don't want to say that by lower end, it's not a good machine because it's done everything that I need it to do. But it's not a Miller, it's not a Lincoln, it's not an ESOB, it's not something that's gonna cost me three or four thousand dollars to get started, right? Now, what it does on a lot of those smaller machines, especially inverters, they are pre programmed to have a set amount of time of gas flow, right? Your post flow of your well. And that's very, very, very important when it comes to doing TIG art. And the reason is, is because your post flow, 
you are able to dictate the color or the oxidation rate of your weld. So, um, for example, my Forney machine is set at about three seconds. Sometimes that's enough, sometimes it's not. What that means is, is after I break arc for three seconds, I have post flow, I have gas coming out and then it automatically shuts off. Well, sometimes I need more than that. So a, a way to negate that on every single machine that offers lift arc or scratch start with a foot pedal is by running on that program, you don't have that built in. So as long as I'm stepping on the foot pedal, after I'm done, I could run post flow for 30 or 40 seconds, right? So that's another reason why I choose to run on lift arc instead of high free. Not only that, but I'm getting sweaty all the time and I get shocked and that makes me not a happy camper. So there's that. Now with that being said, we're gonna roll into the next part, which is your material. Now, what I'm gonna give you when it's things you need, right, to get started doing TIG art is the things that I use. It's not to say it's the only way or it's right or wrong, but it's what I've found to work for me. So um, what I tend to use is 304 stainless steel and everybody that does TIG art, it runs from 12 gauge to 20 gauge, right? Um, I recommend starting out at a thicker material and if you're not familiar with the way gauging works on sheet metal is the lower the number the thicker the material 12 gauge for reference is roughly an eighth of an inch 16 gauge is a sixteenth of an inch i use 20. the reason i use 20 is because it allows me to get a quality product shipped out with less weight that's why I do it. It's what I learned on. It's what I'm familiar with and comfortable with. Um, but I would recommend starting on, you know, 12 to 14 gauge, 304 stainless. Now, the only thing I buy is 304 stainless that's brushed or mirror. Um, I'm going to show you an example. Three oh four that's brushed or mirror will come with this film on it. Okay, don't pay attention to all the nastiness on it. It's protecting it. When I pull that off, it's clean. Everything's good. You may need to give it a quick quick wipe with acetone, um, but other than that, you're good to go. Your other option will be your standard mill, which looks like this, right? It's cheaper and starting out, this is what I would practice on. But when you get to a point where you wanna start doing more quality pieces, um, higher end, I would definitely at least <clears throat> go to brushed. I tend to use brushed more than mirrored. Um, it's more forgiving. Okay, and with that being said, you're gonna need your um, framing material, right? Um, I use 304 stainless. There's a lot of guys that use carbon. I try not to mix carbon with stainless when I can avoid it because it tends to, you know, cross contaminate. That's where you get rust and it just, the longevity of your product could be limited a little bit. Um, if you're wanting to get crazy colors, you know, um, using a torch and heat and all that, you could use carbon. Or if you're gonna paint it, I would use carbon. I wouldn't waste the money. Um, but what I use is 304 flat bar. I use 3 16 by one inch thick. Now that works great for 20 gauge. If you're stepping up into the thicker material, it's not enough to hold it flat. So what I would probably do 
is instead of getting three sixteenths thick, I would step up to a quarter or sometimes even five sixteenths. Um, so we've got your welder covered. We've got your uh, material for the arc and we've got your framing material covered. Um, with that, we're gonna roll into the shielding gas you need. You need 100% argon, right? Anytime you're running TIG, that's what you need. And I would advise getting the biggest bottle you can get because you're gonna run through a lot of it. Okay, so got your argon covered. Next thing that you're gonna need is a good regulator. Now, a lot of these, I don't wanna say low end. I know I said that earlier. Um, Let's say middle tier. So from a thousand to two thousand dollar welders, most of the time they're inverters, they tend to come with regulators that look like this. Okay. This is great for MIG. And it's even great for TIG when you just need adequate gas coverage, right? But the problem is, is it's hard to dial it in to get it just the way you want it. So what I would recommend and what I use, I do not use this for TIG art, would be, would be a regulator like so. So the reason I use this is because you can dial it in a little better. It's a little more forgiving and it's numbered here. Okay, in your CFH. That way you can know exactly how much gas is coming out. And I'll explain at a later time why this is so important. Uh, Profax makes them, you can get them on Amazon. The next thing we're gonna cover and probably the most important when it comes to TIG art is TIG cups, okay? TIG cups, especially that have a diffuser in them. I'll show you what I use. There's many brands out there. I use edge welding cups, okay? The reason I use them, I love that they have a bunch of different diameters and cups, right? They have different cup designs and each one has a screen in it. And the reason, so for example, you've got a G18, right? that has a diffuser in it. And then I can step down to a smaller cup. But they all have diffusers in them. Can go even smaller. And the reason why the diffuser, or the it, what it really is is just screen mesh, right? And the reason it's important is because you already have a gas cup inside of your TIG torch and that disperses the gas right but as you that is one size diffuser screen so it's only going to disperse the gas a certain amount as your cup gets bigger you start having negative space where that gas is not being used to its full potential that's where Cups like these are crucial to doing TIG art because gas coverage is everything. You want to be able to control your oxidation. Oxidation equals color, right? So those are the cups that I use. Um, I'll link everything below. And I'm not partnered with them. I'm not affiliated with them. Everything that you're seeing outside of the Forney welder, right? I'm not partnered with, I bought with my own money or through art trades. And actually what you're gonna find for me is I keep everything real on here, okay? And the Forney welders, I'm partnered with them, but I did artwork to trade for it. So if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't use it. Everything that I use is because I believe in it, not because it's been given to me. So, with that being said, there is a couple other options. And let's see here. So I know you have Furic cups. 
This is honestly the only one that I've got of his. It works great. Um, I like that it's ceramic, but it really doesn't apply to TIG art. I use this for walking the cup because with glass cups, you can't, right? They'll break. Um, but I'm a firm believer in using companies that are relatable, that are personable, that do right by me. That one hasn't. So take it for what you will. All right, moving on to the next. The next thing we're gonna cover is gonna be filler material, right? The only thing I use is 316. It tends to get better color, it's more forgiving. There's not as much floaties in the weld and it's all I use. So um, I recommend Blue Demon. Let's see if I can get a close up here. They are the only brand I use when it comes to filler material. Um, you're gonna need 0 0.035, 0 0.045, and 1 16th. If I had to recommend one, it would be 0 0.045. That's what I use on everything. Um, it's small enough to do the small details and it's big enough to be able to do the weaves which we're going to cover um, next after that is going to be your tungsten right so the tungsten that you're going to need is going to need to be two percent thoriated there's a bunch of brands out there uh, you can do well mark um, like so but your tungsten is critical because the better quality that it is, the less contamination you're gonna have and the more life you're gonna get out of each one, right? I use two. Um, I know I said 2% thoriated. If you're going with that, I use CK Worldwide. Their laser tungsten, 332. is really the only size you need. It's the most versatile size and you know it's small enough that you can do the smaller or the uh, lower amperage and it's big enough that it'll handle a little higher heat uh, 1 16th is a little too small in my opinion it you know just the slightest nick or hiccup and it gets contaminated so like I said it, I recommend using CK Worldwide's laser tungsten 332 and Blue Demon, they're multi-mix, right? And the easy way to remember, I call them pinkies. Everybody else does too. And if I had to choose one, that would be the one that I choose. You're gonna need something to transfer your design, right, to the material and there's two options, actually there's three. If you're a good enough artist, you can freehand it on there. Um, or you can buy, let's say some, uh, what do you call them? Templates, would they be templates? Where you can trace them out. I've got some over there, I can't think of the term. Um, so you've got your templates, you can draw them out with a Sharpie or you can find a design online that's not copyrighted and you can print it off. We're gonna cover that on the next video. But after you do that, you gotta have a way of being able to transfer it to it. And even if you use a Sharpie and you write it down, you know, you draw it out, sketch it out, looks great. You go to light up on it, it disappears. So what I use is a Dremel. <coughs> I'm gonna pan down here so I can better explain. This is what I use. So I use the Dremel 3000. You can get them at Walmart, like 45 bucks. And then what I've done, you can use it as is, but what I've done is I've got on Amazon and for like another 30 bucks, you buy this attachment, right? 
that goes here and it makes it to where it feels a lot better in the hands and speaking of hands if you see paint all over me i've been working on a project so uh, i apologize but this is what i use it's never let me down i've got probably 200 hours into this and it works fantastic flawlessly um, after that you're going to need a good set of bits These are what I use. The number one bit that you're gonna use is an eighth inch ball bit, right? Ball burr bit. If you have this, you can do pretty much anything you need to do to transfer your design. And then you've got an assortment or an array of different kinds of bits, small, large, medium, um, for doing other things that we're going to cover later on but to get started literally all you need is a dremel and you need an eighth inch ball burr bit and now that we've got that covered you're going to need a four and a half inch grinder and i'm not going to go into crazy detail over that. Everybody knows what a four and a half inch grinder is, I would assume. <sighs> the one I use just so happens to be a Makita with a paddle switch. Um, always leave your guards on. And the number one consumables or abrasives that you're going to need is going to be a cutoff wheel um, for cutting your frames. Um, for cutting your skip welds off of your work project. Um, I use Metabo, I only use Metabo, they never let me down. You're also gonna need an assortment of flapper wheels um, from 40 grit, 80 grit, and 120 grit. We'll go over that at a later date. And then some sanding pads. These are just to make quick work of, you know, knocking off any kind of excess residue or knocking down your skip welds. And we'll cover that at a later date as well. I know this video may be a little bit redundant to some and it may be a little boring, but I'm trying to be as informative as I can to cover everything you need to do TIG art. That way you're starting off on the right foot. Um, so with that, we're gonna go into chemicals that you need. And it's only two. Acetone and Windex and some trusty microfiber towels. Now you need acetone to clean your project before you start and you need Windex for post weld cleaning. It's the safest thing I've found that protects your weld from discoloration of the oxidation or the colors that you've worked so hard to achieve. And you need some good microfiber towels. The ones that I buy, um, I found them at Walmart. They are specifically for um, like windshields and glass. So you'll have this side and then you got a soft side. The biggest thing that you wanna make sure is that you've got good quality microfiber towels. So when you're cleaning your project, right? That you don't scratch it and then you're shooting yourself in the foot. So with that, we're gonna move on to something that's pretty important. And if this is kind of scrambled, I apologize. I, I made a list and I wrote everything down that I know y'all need, and it may not be categorized appropriately, but bear with me, we're gonna cover it all. Now, you need an auto darkening weld hood. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you a couple examples that I use. Okay, so this is an auto darkening welding hood from Optrail. It's phenomenal. Um, I have had some issues with the lens in the past, but they corrected it and replaced it for free. Um, and so I use this one and the other one that I use, um, because this is, I'm not gonna lie, it's a little expensive. It's between 450 and $500, depending on where you find it. This is 
a hood from Blue Demon. And I love Blue Demon because they tend to make very high quality products at a great price point. Um, I honestly use this more than I do my Optrail. Um, I think this can be had, don't quote me on it, for around 150 bucks. And the reason you need a good auto darkening welding hood for doing artwork is because you're running at a lower amperage. Okay, you're running at a lower amperage, so your standard lenses, you're not gonna be able to see what you're gonna do. And when I say lower amperage, like I covered earlier, you may be running at 35, 40 amps. So you need, I don't really care what brand you get, but you need a welding hood that will go down to at least nine on shade level and preferably eight. I use eight a lot. Um, and you want one that has very good sensitivity. I wouldn't recommend Miller. I wouldn't recommend Lincoln. I've never had good luck with them and I've tore them up quickly. Um, I'd recommend Autrell. Um, I'd recommend Blue Demon. Excuse me, um, at work, I use uh, the Aesop Sentinel. It's been phenomenal um, and I'm hard on stuff. So those three would be a great great option to go with because you're only going to be as good at the end of the day as what you're looking through and how clear it is. Those are the three clearest hoods that I've used. So with that being said, what else do we need? TIG gloves, right? Not stick gloves, not MIG gloves, not heavy duty. You're running at a lower amperage. So you want the lightest, TIG glove that you can find and you want one with good dexterity. What's dexterity? Dexterity is how much you can feel in your fingertips. I'm going to show you an off-brand pair that I use. Right? These here. I've got some other gloves, but I can't show them right now, unfortunately. So this is what we're going with. I apologize for the nip slip that keeps happening, but I'm in my garage and I want to be comfortable. So when I say dexterity, you want a glove that you can feel, right? You don't want one that's so thick that you can't, you can't feel what you're doing. There, well, as long as you go with a TIG glove that is goat skin, you'll be okay. You can find them on Amazon cheap, nine, 10 bucks off brand. And soon, I'll be able to tell you something else. But for now, off-brand, Amazon, nine or 10 bucks, that's all you need. Don't need to break the bank. It just needs to be something that has good feeling. Um, couple basic hand tools. You're gonna need a combination square and you're gonna need a tape measure, okay? You need combination square because you need to be able to make your 45s for your frames, right? You need tape measure so you know what the hell you're measuring. Um, let's see, after that, oh, you're gonna need a chill block, okay? What is a chill block? A chill block is this right here, okay? I'm filming myself, so bear with me. Now, what a chill block is, is essentially, it is a thicker piece of material that you weld a thin piece of material to that acts as a heat sink that pulls the heat out and it tricks this thicker piece of material into thinking it's way thicker than it is. So that allows you to get the color, terrible lighting, but it allows you to do a lot more on thin material than you would ever be able to do, right? Now, what I use is I've got a 24 by 24 piece of A36 carbon steel and it is two inches thick, okay? And outside of that, y'all, I mean, really the only thing you need, need to make sure you have a weld table. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be something crazy or expensive. Uh, the one that I bought is from Northern Tool. I think it cost me 150 bucks. You can get something from Harbor Freight. It just needs to be big enough and heavy enough to support your chill block. So if it supports 100 pounds, you're good. 
Um, outside of that, you want to make sure you've got some clamps um, to be able to clamp down your art piece um, and frame it later on. We're going to cover that in an upcoming video. And that's about it. I mean, really, um, you could have a computer and a printer, uh, you know, uh, be able to, I guess, expand your options uh, as far as being able to look online and print out what you want. And I'm going to show you how to scale all that to size if you do next video. Um, but if you don't have that and you just want to get started and you know, you don't really have much of a free hand, uh, the cheapest and quickest way to do it is to use a template. Like so, right? Super simple. You take that, put it on your piece, trace it out with a Sharpie and then um, etch it out with a Dremel, which we're gonna cover. And you can buy them on Amazon. I wanna say in packs of 20 for like 10 bucks. Um, but other than that, y'all, that's about it. Uh, I know this is kind of all over the place. Literally what I did was I wrote down everything that I thought y'all needed. And it may not be categorically correct, but I wanted to make sure that I covered everything. Uh, this will be by far the most boring video <laughs> on here. Uh, we're going to get into good stuff on the next one. Um, I just, I really wanted to be thorough and make sure that everything was covered. Now, with that being said, if you're still with me, what we're going to do is we're going to have a 12 by 10 piece, right? That we're going to do step by step through this series. And I need y'all's help because I don't really know what I want to do. And I'm going to leave it up to y'all. Put it in the comments below. I'm going to give you four options. We can do some type of skull. We can do a Harley design since it's a get, since it is not being commissioned can't be copyrighted um, we could do a deer or a sports team um, let me know what you want right it's up to y'all and here's the kicker at the end of this i'm going to give it away to one of y'all one person will receive that a sticker pack and a new unreleased well noki hat from me so um just a way for me to say thank you and to help y'all, or I guess help me have y'all stick around and stick through this and, you know, hopefully you learn something cool. And I really love helping people. So without rambling anymore, I guess uh, stick around and stay tuned for the next one. It will be part two, will be choosing a design, how to lay it out, how to scale it to size, how to etch it, and then get everything prepped for weld. So uh, without keeping y'all any longer, I appreciate it and catch you next time.